What is going on, guys? I'm here with a man that needs absolutely no introduction whatsoever. Jimmy Song is the founder of ProgrammingBlockchain.com. He is also a contributor to Coindesk as well as Medium.com. I want to thank him for being so gracious with his time. The interview couldn't have been easier to set up. Uh, this is the first time that I talk with Jimmy besides the small email exchange that, that we had leading up to this. And I'm really excited to talk with him and get his take on some burning questions that I had regarding Bitcoin and crypto in general. So here is Jimmy Song. Because if you have your own money, um, if, you, if the government doesn't control the money, then there's, uh, there's some natural limits to what they can do. And uh, and, you know, what, one of the things that I, I love reading about is just, uh, you know, how what, what things were like under the gold standard and then how things have been under the fiat standard. And one of the biggest things for me that was just a huge eye opener was that before World War I, almost every war was limited by the inability of the government to pay its debts. So... Basically, uh, if two countries would be at war, one of them would run out of money first, and then that would, uh, and then they would have to sue for peace or whatever. Um, and what happened with World War One was that you know there was fiat money, and with fiat money you can inflate away people's savings, and that's what these countries did, and that allowed them to basically take the wealth of an entire nation and spend money that way. And that's, that's why it was just so devastating. It was originally just a, you know, a minor conflict between Serbian separatists and the heir to the Austro-Hungarian empire. Mm -hmm. And that somehow blew up into this world war because, uh, you know, everyone was like, Hey, we could spend more money. Uh, it, yeah, we can, we don't, we don't have to back down. Uh, and that's, I think what we're getting back to with Bitcoin is not just financial sovereignty, but real political sovereignty as well. Cause now the government doesn't need, uh, well, needs your permission, whereas they didn't really need it under a fiat system because they can just inflate it away whenever they want. Right. Um, you have to realize that's a, that's a huge in, in, infringement on, upon your freedom and monetary sovereignty is a huge part of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that's basically at different points in time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the government, for instance, abolishing the gold standard. Um, and then there was the whole concept of, of the war economy, basically being able to print money in order to fund wars mm -hmm. and it being some sort of self-fulfilling cycle where then the wars would then pump more money into the economy. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a that's a, an interesting perspective, because usually, you know, you only hear about uh, Bitcoin disrupting the um, I guess the traditional banking sector and not really what the implications politically are. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Mm. Um, so, so just taking it back to, to, to the development, there are some questions that, that I'm really curious about. Would you say that um, you're mostly focused on Bitcoin development or would the skills that, that you teach in your academy apply to somebody who is developing, say, a smart contract platform or a DAP platform? I mean, I, I, I think they can use it, but I, I don't really know what a smart contract platform or a DAP platform really mean. I mean, like people, people talk about it like it's a, it, it's, a, it's a thing and that there's a you know, ton of people that are doing it. I mean, I guess there are tons of people doing it. It's just there are no users for a lot of this stuff. The use cases for, uh, for D apps or, or um, you know, like, these all coins or smart contracts. I mean, I, I've written multiple articles on this. Almost always, it it comes down to okay. Well, why do we need this again? <laughs> uh, it's kind of <laughs> like the word blockchain. It's like, okay, uh, yeah, supposedly this could be very very useful to these particular people, but when you actually look under the hood and look at the engineering reality you suddenly realize, okay, you either need to trust someone, which takes away the entire point, or, it, you know, like there's some central party or something like that. And yeah, I mean, you could use it for a lot of these platforms. Absolutely. Uh, but like, to me, the Bitcoin protocol, the Bitcoin is the major innovation. That's the one thing that everyone is using. Mm -hmm. uh, almost everything else is, okay, well, we can go raise some more money or something. I, 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 like, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I've been very skeptical of that whole uh, industry, and it, it feels very bubblish and frothy to me. 
Yeah, that's that's a good point. I was at a, a actually a really crappy conference that I came back from in, in Silicon Valley, but uh, there was only one intriguing speaker and he was an old school guy coming from from Wall Street and he was a, an advisor to one of these uh altcoin I think it was uh Qtum and his name is Jeff Wernick, I believe. But he was basically saying that you know, you have this uh the the, the mechanism of of raising funds easily unreg in an unregulated fashion through ICOs and you have smart contract platforms or or the I guess at a larger perspective blockchain and people are just trying to find ways to raise money and not really solve any real world pro problems they're trying to apply these two mechanisms that currently exist that are really easy to get into right mm -hmm. um and and say you know yeah we are now the blockchain that does this or or the the platform does that, that does this and not really trying to solve a real world problem and um and and you know go from there instead they're trying to move backwards in order just to raise funds and and i guess i don't know gain popularity through through the uh the, the blockchain community yeah i mean it's uh it's turned out to be very easy to raise money from a lot of these individuals right like yeah a lot of people will put money into almost anything and this is uh largely due to greed uh there's greed on the part of the people that are issuing the tokens they don't need the money um i mean maybe they need the money but they don't have a product that's going to make money um but you know they, they're like okay well we can raise like 100 million doing this um and there's greed on the other side. The people that are buying the tokens, they think they can flip it in like three months and double their money. Um, right. And, it, and it's, uh, it, that's the exact recipe for a bubble when everyone's greedy and like no one is actually checking uh, any of this stuff. So <laughs> I, it's, uh, it's very frustrating to me because I, I, I think that's a lot of, you know, human effort and, uh, you know, stuff going into essentially rent seeking behavior, right? Like uh, no, no one's actually building anything. Uh, right. They're, you know, I, I mean, like it's hilarious when you look at a lot of these ICOs, what ends up happening. So EOS raised like $3 billion and they're like, okay, well, what do we do with this $3 billion? Uh, yeah. Well, they go and fund other people to go make stuff for them. And what do they do? Well, they do an ICO. And then they raise like some amount of money and they're like, well, what do we do with this money? We don't actually want to build anything. Yeah. And then they, they, they go out and fund, uh, fund another company that does another ICO. And it, it, it's, it's become like this weird shell game where like just the money goes from one to another and like nobody's actually building stuff, which is, or if they are building something, it's like really stupid and doesn't have any users and it, I, and, and you could see this reflected in the markets too. Like I, I know that, that you're, uh, you know, close with, with tone, mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, other than that, I don't know how much you delve into the markets, but you see this reflected in the markets where people get excited about projects that haven't launched anything. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the projects that actually have a, a, the few that actually have a working product, um, you know, people are, are just kind of like, Oh yeah, that's old news. And it reminded me of that scene in, in Silicon Valley where, you know, the angel investor was asking him, uh, what's the point of, of, of building this business? And they're like, to make money. And he's like, wrong. Because the minute that you make money, you set expectations. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know? But if you don't make money, then you will always be a potential pure play, right? So, uh -huh. you, so you're all, there's, you always provide people that, that, that hope that you could be something. Um, and that's what I feel like that the crypto market is. It's it's just people are so enamored with projects that haven't produced anything or don't even have a proof that they're accountable for for producing something, right? And it's it's uh, it, it it gets really annoying. Um, but yeah, I, I mean that's a really good way to put it. it uh, they're they're all putting their money on hopium. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> hope of this thing might that uh, might replace Bitcoin someday. I, I half suspect that's really what people are investing in. Okay, I think this will be better than Bitcoin, and I'll get you know thousand x returns. It's it's uh, not only greed that's driving them. It's envy of like old old school holders of Bitcoin, basically. Right. Right. <laughs> Um, so, so taking it back to, to Bitcoin, um, I, I had asked you a question on, on email, but if, mm -hmm. if you could, I guess, magically snap your fingers or go back in time and alter uh, Bitcoin's mechanism from proof of work to some, something else, whether it's proof of stake or a hybrid model, 
Um, is, is there, would there be benefit in doing so or is proof of work uh, within the, the Bitcoin model still the, the most um, consistent and, and secure way of going about things, I guess? Yeah, I, I would say proof of work is the most secure and uh, everything else is not been proven. And, and this goes back to the monetary properties of Bitcoin. Uh, and we call Bitcoin hard money, uh, just like gold hard money. And the reason why we call it hard money is because it is hard to produce. If it was easy to produce, then it would be easy money. Like fiat money is very easy money. Um, and easy money tends to not get valued as highly as hard money. And Bitcoin mm. is even harder money than gold because of the strict 21 million limit. Um, and I would say that Bitcoin, uh, in order to be hard money, needs it to be really difficult to produce that money. And proof of work is exactly that mechanism. And besides which, you, you have a ledger that's distributed. That means that there needs to be some objective standard in order to progress that uh, ledger. And that's what proof of work is. It's an objective standard. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, whoever finds the proof of work gets to publish that. Anything else, um, including proof of stake, some sort of weird consensus algorithm, they rely on some trust or some... Um, uh, you know, some privileged uh, group or something. And, and it, gets, uh, it gets worse and worse from there. But basically, it ends up being easier money. And the fact that it has proof of work at a deep level, um, if you understand proof of work, it's more or less, uh, they call it mining for a reason. You, mm -hmm. you, you have to go, uh, I'm, I'm told that to mine one ounce of gold, you need to go through about two to 90 tons of dirt and rock. Mm -hmm. And you need to process them to find just one ounce of gold for mm -hmm. gold mining. And it's the same exact thing for proof of work, except it's instead of rock and dirt, it's numerical equivalents of rock and dirt. You need to go through lots and lots of numbers before you find that one proof of work that will satisfy. And that is at its heart why Bitcoin is hard money. So you take that away it's suddenly not hard money anymore. It, it becomes something else. Um, it becomes permissioned money. It becomes, um, you know, I don't know, centralized money. And, right. uh, and you're, you're really trying to subvert the laws of the universe if, you're, if you think you can uh, make hard money without putting in the hard work. Does that make right. sense? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. For, for sure makes sense. And yeah, I mean, I've heard both sides of the argument with regards to the value of gold, whether the the work that it takes to to yank it out of the ground is actually intrinsically built in the value or if if it has nothing to do with the value at, at all and i i just don't see the the argument that it has nothing to do with the value the fact that it's really hard to get is is why it's it's so valuable or part of the reason at least why it's so valuable um because you know people talk about how how conductive of a metal it is and and etc mm -hmm. but um but yeah the fact that it's so hard to get and you actually have to do work to get it is 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 why part of the reason why it's it's valuable so yeah. st sticking with the the proof of work then um I, you what do you think of of 51 percent attacks like do you think that they're a realistic threat um i don't even know not too sure about the the history of 51 percent attacks if something like that has ever um been been close to to becoming a, a reality or or if the there is anything in the mechanism that would um that makes a 51% attack really an unrealistic thing, but it is theoretical, right? It, it can theoretically uh, happen, but yeah. is it so far out of the realm of possibility? I mean, I wouldn't say it's out of the realm of possibility, but um, I mean, Bitcoin was designed so that people are economically incentivized to do the right thing. A 51% attack is more or less um, subverting that economic incentive model. So basically it's saying, okay, I have 51%, I'm gonna double spend or something like that. Um, first of all, you can't take away anyone's money from a 51% attack. You can spend your own money and then take that back, but okay. you can't, you can't, like I can't take your Bitcoins using a 51% attack, that's impossible. Um, uh, there are also lots of mitigations that a lot of people don't talk about. Um, so if, uh, if there was like a, an obvious 51% attack, say like a 20 block reorg that took, uh, you know, some, some money back from like 20 blocks ago that they got some good or service for, um, 
it, it, users are still sovereign over their own nodes. So that means that I can go say, okay, that looks malicious to me. I'm going to invalidate that block. And I can go and do that. Any, anyone with a full node can do that. And they can say, I, I refuse to run on that fork of the ledger. I can, I, I'll, I'll go on this other one. Um, and that's ev it's something that everyone can do uh, at, at any point. And mm -hmm. uh, in fact, this was sort of the basis for UASF and what, what they were claiming is, okay, well, we're not going to accept these uh, blocks that aren't signaling for SegWit. That, that was the idea. Um, and you, you, you have the right to do that as your own node. And, you, and there's even a command for it. You can invalidate block and, and just say, okay, well, I think this one's malicious, so I'm not going to uh, let it take over my node. Right. So uh, in, in that sense, it's, uh, it's very much decentralized. And even if a quote-unquote 51% attack does something, there are mitigating things that you can do. Uh, that said, is it realistic? Not, I really don't think so. Most of the time when they talk about it, it's 51% of hash power lives in like one or two pools or something like that. Mm -hmm. Miners can still move pools, and many of them do if it gets closer to 51%. Um, if it's a single entity that owns all of it, again, if they don't, like, then it's like centralized power, but again, the entire network can cut off that particular bad actor right uh like with with a couple of commands anyone running a full node can and uh may do that if they're like well okay they they're obviously attacking the network i don't i, I don't want to i don't want any of their blocks their back blocks are no good for me and each person can can choose to do that so it becomes this uh weird game theory and the nash equilibrium ends up being that you know you just keep mining blocks as normal so mm -hmm. uh you know a lot of people don't really seem to get that this is uh, this is the main way and they underestimate the social nature of bitcoin and how people have ways to punish uh bad actors in in the system that's a good point. Yeah, because they always talk about tragedy of commons, right? Like mm -hmm. where participants will act in, in their own self-interest and we'll get to a point where, you know, the, the miners will only process transactions that give them the higher fees and thereby somehow manipulating the, the transaction costs because they're only going to push forward transactions with higher fees. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and that, that's their right. If they want to only publish transactions with, uh, with high enough fees, then they can do that. But I can also run another one and pick up all of the, uh, you know, fees that they aren't picking up by running my own. So, I mean, it, it, economically, it's, it's a really well-designed system so that, you know, any, any, anything that you do suboptimally, someone can take advantage of. That's a, that's a great point. That's a great point. It, it's almost an intrinsic system of checks and balances that mm -hmm. isn't centralized, um, mm -hmm. but, but relies on, on the people to, to move forward. So that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, so with that said, I mean, do, do you think that Bitcoin energy, if proof of work is, is you know, the, the most mm -hmm. solid way to go forward, do you think that uh, the energy costs that, that are attributed to Bitcoin that you see overblown, I guess, I, I won't say overblown, but that, that are reported in the media, do you think that they're, they're overblown? Um, or do we need to take that into consideration as a, a threat for the future and somehow try to mitigate the energy costs or the energy consumption associated with, with Bitcoin mining? Yeah, so let's, uh, let, let's reset a few things here. So um, in any sort of monetary system, there are two ways to make money. You can try to make more of that money, which is what mining is in Bitcoin, or you can uh, you know, provide some good or service to other people and they can pay you money, right? Um, when, if you're trying to create your own money, that would be like uh, you know, the Spanish going out to the Americas and you know, uh, digging for gold and shipping them back and so on. Mm -hmm. um, in a fiat system, there's also people that are working to make their own money. They're called banks, right? And if you look at like how much GDP, uh, banks, investment banking, and all these banking-related services take up, that's like 10, 15% of the economy. And they're, they're not doing anything productive, right? They're just creating more of this money. Um, and especially if you're a bank, uh, if you have a banking license, you can factionally reserve, which is essentially printing your own money. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you, you're, you're participating in that. So compared to 
the current system, Bitcoin is way, way better, right? Like uh, banking sector is 10, 15% of the economy. Uh, that's the equivalent of mining in, in the fiat system. Now with mining, um, uh, first of all, uh, well, second uh, point that I would make is that a lot of the mining is, is actually very, very efficient. Uh, and that's because they're financially incentivized to go get the cheapest possible energy that there is. And uh, something that a lot of people don't know about uh, the energy grid around the world is that a lot of energy actually goes wasted. Um, so, you know, something like geothermal energy in Iceland, you know, they, uh, they heat up pools and stuff and, you know, they try to use it. Uh, but a lot of it is just dissipated heat. It, it goes, it goes away because, uh, there's no need for all of that energy. They don't have right. the battery technology to properly store the energy in some efficient way. Uh, so when you, when you bring in, you know, somebody with mining, it actually costs them almost nothing for the electricity, uh, I mean, other than the capital costs of the construction of the, uh, of the actual mining facility, mm -hmm. but the energy oftentimes costs almost nothing. And there, there are things like that all over the grid, right? Like there, uh, there are places in the US where it, for the electricity to go over a river costs so much money that the electric company is willing to pay you to take electricity right before it crosses the river. Right. Now, if you, if you put a miner there, you're making money two ways. You're making money by making Bitcoin, and you are also making money because the, uh, the electricity company is paying you to take some of this energy away. Uh, same thing with like oil rigs and stuff like that. Oftentimes they need to just burn off the oil at the very beginning of like, uh, you know, using the oil. If you can utilize that energy to mine, I mean, that, that's free. Again, like they're paying you to utilize that energy because they'd mm -hmm. rather not pollute the environment. Um, and so there are all sorts of things like that which aren't taken in, into account. What these journalists do is they like multiply a few numbers and say this is how much it's using. Uh, when in fact, like most of the energy in the world is actually very hard to store. <laughs> Here's the, that's yeah. a big thing. So you have a hydroelectric dam. How are you, if you don't use, util, transmit that energy to homes and utilize it, it, like battery technology just sucks. It's, it, it's very hard to like store energy in a reliable way. This, uh, so you end up like just wasting a lot of it and it dissipates into heat or something else and uh, it gets wasted. Whereas like Bitcoin's now making that like, making a lot of that energy just, uh, you know, go somewhere useful and uh, in right. towards uh, securing the blockchain. So, yeah, I, I see it as a really good thing uh, that proof of work and mining and all that stuff exists. Yeah, I've seen I've seen actual net numbers um, and I, I, I should have had the graph uh, pulled up for this. But yeah, and it was just comparing real real energy costs versus other things that, that take up energy. Mm. And it was nowhere near the numbers that were reported. Like it's so minuscule compared to things that, and hilarious things too, like, uh, you know, people using hair dryers and, and things. Like that. <laughs> I, I should have pulled up the, the graph before this because it is really funny. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I do get the sense that it, the, the threat um, is kind of overblown in, in the media. So, mm. um, it, and then with regards to, to Bitcoin, I mean, do you see it, the, the, the fact that it's finite, right? So obviously mm -hmm. 21 million ever, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that intrinsically that then, you know, relegates it to, to, to always being a store of value versus a currency that somebody can use? Because, um, you know, there's this interesting thought that people spend what they don't value, right? So cash, mm -hmm. people, people don't buy don't buy things in, in gold or don't buy things in diamonds, but cash is something that, that is seen as easily acquirable and easily spendable. Um, and it's not really valued, uh, especially since the interest rates are, are really low. But do um, you think that 21 million Bitcoins, you know, relegates it to, to always being a store of value uh, versus a currency that, that people will spend uh, frequently? Well, so medium of exchange versus store of value, I would say, um, store value is the initial one, and that's because people value its scarcity. Um, every monetary medium has to be scarce. Otherwise, it's not really a very good monetary medium because anyone can go get more of it, and people will spend a lot more time creating more of the monetary medium rather than anything productive. 
Um, but uh, what you're referring to is Gresham's law, and that's a law from economics, which says that uh, when you have good money and bad money, people will spend the bad money first. And that is absolutely true. And you can see that in places like Venezuela, where if you have boulevards and dollars, you will spend your boulevards first. And for obvious reasons, because the dollar holds its value much, much better. Uh, now, with respect to uh, Bitcoin uh, being relegated to store value, I mean, at a certain point when everything else is um, sort of inflating away relative to Bitcoin a lot more, what's going to happen? Well, I think what happens is people start demanding Bitcoins instead of U.S. dollars. Or if, if they are taking U.S. dollars, they're converting to Bitcoin right away. Um, which is, you know, like a, another way of looking at how you can make it into kind of a medium of exchange is that people convert to dollars, pay in dollars, and then convert back to Bitcoin. Right. It's kind of the reverse of what a lot of uh, these places do now where, you know, you pay in Bitcoin, they just convert to U.S. dollars or whatever. Uh, but that, that's, uh, that's, I think, in the future as, as people start demanding it. The economic incentives are such that you know, people will simply demand uh, Bitcoins. And then, you know, like that, that's how it becomes a medium of exchange, not necessarily because Roger Ver is telling everybody you need to use it as a medium of exchange. It's, it's due to natural incentives, not because someone, uh, some centralized entity is telling you you need to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and do you think that there, there will be sort of an inflection point or, I mean, Obviously, we, we most likely won't be alive uh, when the 21 millionth Bitcoin is, is mined unless we figure out how to download our consciousness into, uh, <laughs> into a bot of some sort. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, what, is there, do you envision there being some sort of uh, you know, major, major event that takes place after the 21 millionth Bitcoin is mined? Um, and you know, people, would people then, um, I guess you know, start hoarding it? Would, would, would it then, you know, be something that, uh, that is, is just spendable between people easily? Um, I, I'm not sure that, that I can wrap my head around what I think would happen with such a finite resource that is also, um, you know, treated or, or intended to be treated as, as, a, as a currency. Yeah, so uh, I, I, Safe Dean's book, The Bitcoin Standard, is actually really good at explaining what an ideal money is. Um, any amount of money, as long as it's divisible enough, is, is good enough as, as a monetary medium. The fact that you know, central banks are focused on creating more of it is just a way to shrink the pie for everybody else. Uh, hmm. um, and, uh, and it doesn't really matter if there's 21 million, 18 million, 17 million, whatever. Uh, as long as there's a fixed number and you can't create more of it, that's the important thing because that causes people to uh, do the second thing to make money, which is provide goods and services that everyone wants. And that's, that's really where you want society, not uh, a bunch of people creating, uh, you know, trying to create money, getting into investment banking and stuff. I mean, you, you look at the last year, you, even yourself, right? Like uh, you, were, you were telling me earlier that, you got into finance in large part because of this uh, idea that you can make a lot of money doing it. Uh, you're, a lot of people went into investment banking and finance in the last generation and they, they, they didn't really need to, right? Like, or they, they didn't really contribute that much in, in doing so. They were, they were just doing, um, you know, rent, they, were, they were basically rent seeking off of, off of the whole thing. They weren't really contributing to society. And I see this kind of behavior all over the place. I, I, uh, there's a quote that I really like. Uh, this guy said, um, you know, we're, we're hiring, uh, we're using the best and the brightest of our generation to get a few more clicks. And that, I mean, that's so, because advertising at its core is really kind of like a rent-seeking marketing thing. Yeah. And it's, 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 not, it's not really adding that much. Uh, when you have sound money, when you have something that's actually scarce, uh, like we did in the 1870s to about 1910, like that's called the Bella Epoch, the golden age, because everyone was on the gold standard. Some right amazing innovations came to light because you had to actually 
find something that people wanted, goods and services that people wanted. Instead, we have a society that's at least 50% rent seekers by my estimation, right? It's people that aren't doing anything. There's, there's a book called Bullshit Jobs, right? And it, it, it's all talking about how like most jobs in corporate America today are essentially rent seeking. You're, you're not doing anything valuable to anyone mm -hmm. and you're, you're, you can, you can do your job in like, in like two hours a week or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, ha you have to pretend that you're working to satisfy some, you know, uh, box checker, uh, who's also rent seeking and it, it, like, that's the kind of society fiat money produces. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think as we go towards Bitcoin, you're going to see more behavior like the golden age where everyone is creating things that are actually useful to people instead of, you know, useless stuff that no one really values. Right. Uh, because, you know, the government just con continuously encourages consumption uh, you know, like to, to prop themselves up. I, one thing that I heard that, that was kind of a scary thought a while ago was, okay, what if we've already passed the peak of civilization? Uh -huh. What if, like, when we landed a man on the moon in 1969, that was the peak of civilization? Because what have we really done since then? Right. We've, we've created more ways to entertain people. We've created more <laughs> ways to, like keep people busy, yeah. but have we actually made progress as humanity? No, we, we might actually be regressing because even if you talk about things like, uh, like AI mm -hmm. automation, you know, we're getting to a point where we, we're knowingly self-destructing humanity's productivity, right? Like all, all yeah. of these jobs that people value as, as a way to stay productive. Mm -hmm. Um, we know that the advancement of, of these technologies is going to do away with that almost. Well, well yeah, the, the point of a lot of these technologies is to make us more like sheep or something instead of actually being like, okay, well, we can go conquer other planets or something like that. And, uh, and you know, no society thinks that they're on the downtrend when they're actually on the downtrend. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Romans for a long time thought that they were just fine and that they were continuing to progress and things like that. Uh, but, you know, I mean, what if we are on the downtrend? Um, and uh, it's, a, it's kind of a scary thought. But the one thing that really gives me encouragement is Bitcoin, right? Like this is actual sound money again. This is actually uh, inspiring people to create goods and services that people actually want because it is really hard to go and earn a Bitcoin. You try it. Um, I mean, you can go and earn, a, a, you know, earn dollars. But, you know, people don't want to send you Bitcoin unless, you know, I mean, I, maybe they're converting it into something to you. And which right, right. Same thing. But, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it, it gets very, very difficult. And, and, uh, and, you know, tools from the golden age and all that stuff, like, like everything was super high quality. Like, I, I know, like, woodworking people that buy tools from, like, 1890. Because they say any, anything after that, the tools were made be way better than and they weren't built to last. Whereas like crap that you buy now, it just like it falls apart because yeah. it's made for consumption. So you wonder, you wonder about these things. I, I, in, in a way, right. I'm very excited about a future under sound money. And then there's also the, the concept of built in obsoleteness, right? When it comes yeah. to technology, <laughs> it's like they, they want it to be obsolete. In, yeah, in a few years, but but and, yeah, and you can do that when people are very loose with their money. But when they when people are hoarding their money, you better give them some freaking value, man. Uh, right. Otherwise, they're not going to give you their money, and it, it changes the mentality of a lot of corporations. Uh, right now, government and uh, and corporations basically encourage consumption to the nth degree. Uh, you know, you you have to spend. Uh, you got to keep the economy flowing, and you got to spend money to help everybody out. That's uh, that's never how it worked under a sound money system, and it was much more about you know you know, you know, providing value to people and real value lasts. And that, that's something that you, uh, you get under a sound money regime. With that said, I mean, how, how in tune are you with, uh, with the price of, of Bitcoin and, and markets? Is that something that you even care about? Um, are you, you know, do you engage in, in cryptocurrency trading or is that something that, uh, that's totally out of, out of your purview? 
Uh, well, I mean, I, I do pay attention uh, certainly to the price and uh, certainly a, a, along like the hard fork stuff, I, I'm constantly selling them just because there's so many and I have clients that, are, that, that want me to sell for them and stuff like that. So I'm constantly selling uh, and you know, managing that is, uh, is another whole thing. Uh, so I, I, I have to pay attention, but uh, f philosophically, I'm a holder. I, I, I'm not, I, I don't understand the discipline of trading well enough to beat the market. Um, so I, I hold, and that's, that's more or less what I've been doing for a while. Um, that said, you know, price is important. A lot of people are like, ah, oh, you know, price doesn't matter. Uh, you know, it's only about the technology. No, price does matter because mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that's the economy of Bitcoin and, uh, and people talk about price because they use it as a store of value. If they weren't using it as a store of value, you wouldn't care because you would buy into it, spend it, and then get it back. As long as there's no slippage during those two points, you don't really care. And a lot of people buying drugs on Darknet, that's exactly how they think. A lot of people that are using it as like foreign remittances to Ghana or something, that's exactly how they think. They're like, right. well, who cares what the price of Bitcoin is? I'm just going to buy it, send it, and then they're going to get it back. And as long as there's no slippage, I don't care. And, um, right. and that, that's, uh, that's more an indication, I think, of how many people value it as a store of value, the fact that so many people pay attention to price. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I do pay attention to price, but maybe not to the degree that maybe a lot of traders would. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a good point. Are there any, uh, I guess, altcoins or, or other crypto projects that, that have intrigued you, at least in an idea? I know that, that, as we talked about before, there aren't really any finished uh, products that are, that are worth um, mentioning, or, or at least there's, there's just a handful of them, but, but are there any projects currently that, that are intriguing you? Well, so the three that I respect that I always quote are Zcash, Monero, and Decred. Um, and those are the three that, uh, I know from a technological standpoint actually have something pretty innovative. Okay. And, uh, so ZK Snarks is actually pretty interesting. Monero has like confidential transactions, uh, ring signatures and stuff like that. Uh, Decred, uh, those developers created BTCD, which is an alternate client of, um, you know, Bitcoin, and they based it off of that. They're doing some really interesting stuff with um, governance. So I, I pay attention to those three, uh, mm -hmm. definitely. And, uh, and I do that because they actually have something interesting there. So, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, will, will they overtake Bitcoin? I doubt it, but uh, they're worth paying attention to, I think. Um, some of this other stuff that are like just complete clones uh, or like tweak something that's not very interesting or solve a problem that doesn't really need solving. Um, mm -hmm. I don't pay attention to any of those. And I, I put like hash graph and DAGs and all that stuff in, in, the, in that category. They're not solving anything interesting or, uh, or uh, is actually a problem on Bitcoin um, or yeah. Ethereum for that matter, actually. Like smart contracts, Bitcoin already has them. And right. Turing completeness, nobody actually uses Turing completeness. So that's not solving anything. So yeah, it, it's not that interesting to me. Oh, that's, that's an interesting standpoint. Um, so yeah, in, in light of the, the Doug Pogue versus uh, Tone Vase bet that I'm sure you heard about, the, the, mm. the 10K bet, um, I don't know, has that sort of increased uh, your confidence? Or I, I guess, I think, because I saw the interview that, that you did with Doug Pogue, and I think Doug was more... Um, uh, critics, you know, he, he's more critical of technical analysis, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure exactly where, where you stand. Uh, I know that you have friends that, that are really big into it. Um, uh -huh. but has that, that sort of increased your uh, confidence in technical analysis or was that just a, uh, a, a lucky guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I, I do think there is a discipline such as technical analysis and, uh, and I think, uh, at least as far as I can tell, and this is uh, from many conversations with Tone and other people, um, you know, it maps somewhat to natural human biases. So, for example, humans have a loss aversion, right? Like they, they, um, they fear loss more than they uh, enjoy gain. So that, that makes sense. Uh, after a certain amount that you have, you don't, you're just kind of being greedy if you're getting more, but 
it, if it's like right at the level where you're comfortable, like any loss would make you uncomfortable, but the additional stuff that you get wouldn't necessarily make you more comfortable. So, mm-hmm. um, so it, it makes sense. And, uh, and you know, you can sort of see that in technical analysis. There's like, uh, you know, what you call a support line. And that's where, uh, and it usually corresponds to some amount of volume that happened right at that line. Uh, and if it's a lot of people that bought at that time, then there's a lot of people that are going to feel loss aversion if it goes underneath, right? right. So, um, you know, th- this is how, you know, Tone defines like technical support levels. It's like, okay, if it goes below this line, it's going to drop because people hate loss aversion. Makes sense, right? Uh, so there's a lot of stuff like that that sort of maps pretty well to technical analysis. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I'm not going to go and claim that all of them do. Um, and probably a lot of them, we don't really understand the human cognitive bias, biases that mm-hmm. sort of lead to that. Uh, but I think there's enough of it that there's an actual discipline there that, uh, and you can sort of predict certain things. And there's a reason there's a lot of people that are doing it and, you know, make money off of it and mm-hmm. stuff. They're, they're hedge fund managers that swear by this stuff and have made careers out of it. Uh, now, they could be lucky idiots or they could actually have some, um, some skill. Um, I, I think there's something, uh, probably something in between. Um, you know, they, they don't quite know why they do certain things, but they've seen enough of a pattern that they don't need to know exactly what human cognitive bias it, 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 uh, it maps to. And they're, they're like, okay, well, you know, from a time, time standpoint, it goes this way, uh, from a volume standpoint, it goes that way. Um, it goes up slower than it comes down because, you know, like people hate losing money. Um, so yeah, I, so I find technical analysis somewhat fascinating, although I, as, as a discipline, I haven't studied it enough and Tone yeah. tells me like I can take his class whenever I want for free, <laughs> but I just haven't had the time. Um, as far as it giving me more confidence or something, it doesn't, it doesn't, that's a uh, technical analysis to me is much more a short term thing. Um, for me, the long term value proposition is absolutely rock solid on Bitcoin. And that's, that's what I go on and not, mm-hmm. not any of the short term stuff. Yeah. 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 No, it's funny. I think, I think that technical analysis, the idea, uh, th- is is kind of spoiled by the pool of people on on youtube that you see that that are like oh yeah it will be this price on this day and it's like <laughs> dude no that's not the point of technical i did a whole video on it actually but yeah that's not the point of technical analysis so mm. i feel like it's it's uh it's it's been tarnished by by <laughs> YouTube. what hasn't man what yeah, hasn't yeah, you're right. You're 100% right 100% right 100% right so, uh, yeah, we're just, uh, I'll just round up the, the interview with a, a couple of, uh, last questions. The last movie that you watched was, Oh gosh. Uh, you know, I stopped watching movies like a couple of years ago. I think I watched something with one of my kids. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. I, I, it was, I think it was like the last dinosaur or something like that okay. I, yeah, or the good dinosaur. Yeah. Pixar movie. Yeah. That that's, I think the last one I saw, I can't, yeah. I can't remember. The last yeah. movie I tried to watch was Hereditary, which just came out, and I walked out of the theater. It's terrifying. It's that bad. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't watch movies because yeah. I'm, I'm all, like, it, it wastes too much time for me. I, I agree. I agree. Uh-huh. Uh, and then I saw you wearing a uh, soccer jersey, or what it looked uh-huh. like, at least from the neck up, a soccer uh-huh. jersey. Yeah, yeah, it was a it was a Brazilian soccer jersey. Mercado Bitcoin actually made it for me. Oh, it had my name on the back, and they wanted me to cheer for Brazil. And, uh, and so I, 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 I was born in South Korea, so I, I cheer for Korea all the time. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Mexico couldn't pull off that win, so we couldn't make it to the round of 16. Yeah. But, uh, but my, my team now is Brazil because they gave me that jersey. I kind of feel obligated to awesome. cheer for them. So. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that because, yeah, I've been rooting for Brazil since I was five years old. But, uh, yeah. 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 I, 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 what you think of uh, you know, Germany getting knocked out by Korea? How yeah. About that, I mean, huh? It's so funny <laughs> because the, the, the World Cup winner always has a devastating loss uh-huh. in the next World Cup. Like, that's uh-huh. just the history of the world cup it's like a yeah. curse so uh-huh. i i didn't expect them to go out the first round but uh-huh. but yeah i didn't think that they would uh that that uh that they would do that they would actually win win the world cup that was uh okay. i i only watched like just the highlights again i don't watch full games anymore because it wastes too much time but yeah. 
man, that, that, that was a, that was a pretty nervy ending. That was uh, <laughs> yeah. pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. Manuel Neuer coming out to uh, become a midfielder. It was, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> that was hilarious. But yeah, man, I, I want to thank you again for your time, dude. You've been nothing but gracious. It, it's been so easy to get a hold of you and set this thing up. And, uh, and I hope we get to talk more in the future, dude. This awesome conversation. Thank you so much for answering my questions, dude. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let's do it again. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. Take care. All right, thanks.